two years ago, a random PhD student sent me a message on Instagram that changed both of our lives forever. Today, he's not a PhD student anymore. And in fact, he's built a beautiful urban garden, which I'm gonna show you in this video. And here he is, the man, the myth, the legend, Jacques. What's up? Hey, I was just tidying up these tomatoes. Uh, got a lot of determinants on the way these, and a lot of tomatoes. These are looking good. I mean, it's your I know it's your favorite plant of all time. It'll be a consistent theme throughout. I have a confession though. <laughs> oh, yeah. When we first met two years ago, I just told everyone, you just sent me a random message. <laughs> it's true. But I didn't think this was the guy that was gonna send me that message. He had a pumpkin as his picture. He seemed like this old French man with the name cryptic. Jacques, a little cryptic. I was scared to meet him, <laughs> but obviously we met, things went really well, yeah. and we're gonna get into that later. But tell me about the garden, because two years ago, you really didn't know much about gardening at all. <laughs> I almost knew nothing. I knew some basics like what a tomato looks like, and that's about it. But basically, during that 2020 turmoil, this was literally just a sea of grass. This had like a random cactus in it. The bed was basically <laughs> empty. Yeah. And we just started filling this whole area out with tomatoes. So I had like, I think a grid of nine tomatoes here, but it was like 30 steaks. Interesting it planting. All, <laughs> yeah, it was just like a random smattering of tomatoes and steaks and string. It looked like one of those crazy chalkboards where you're trying to connect like yeah. a conspiracy. Yeah. But it worked and we got hooked from there. Basically, I needed to grow nonstop. There's just so much flavor. And that's really what brought me to gardening is the taste. What What's interesting to me is when I'm standing in this garden, yeah. it's beautiful right now, especially as we're almost at summer here, Very close. but it doesn't look like a garden to me of someone who's only grown for, for two years. My garden didn't look like this two years <laughs> in, I'll be honest with you. So I'm curious, like, how did you get so skilled so fast? So I have kind of a addictive uh, trait of consuming knowledge. So my previous Same. experience with this was I was in a PhD program and I actually was one of those weird kids who liked reading the textbook cover to cover. Mm -hmm. um, I just, when I like something, I want to learn everything about it. So I think the first gardening book I picked up was the John Jevons How to Grow Biointensive. And that's basically the script for how I started this garden. It talked about double digging and preparing the soil and all these different kind of plants and systems. And I just kind of got hooked from that point on. And I've just read, I don't even know how many gardening books at this point, but I like to consume and then I like to put it into practice as soon as I can. We'll talk about how you're no longer in your PhD anymore, but it seems like the skills have transferred over really well oh, yeah. to the garden. <laughs> Speaking of, there's a plant I really want to look at, which is Jacques' grape trellis. Oh, let's definitely check it let's out. Let's do it. So over here, this is the flame seedless grape. Huge. <laughs> it's only been here for, I think, two years. One thing you'll see across the garden is that I have a lot of random structures that I built and a lot of dense plantings like this flower bush up here. But this is just two tree stakes, a two by three and some wire. It's like maybe 20 bucks. Yeah. Well, one thing you told me is back in the early days, of course, you're a PhD student still. And when you're building this garden, we did a tour with Jacques. I think you spent not only for this garden, but the back garden, which is bigger, and you're going to see <laughs> so and half. the custom chicken coop, maybe under two grand. Yeah, easily, because we did repurpose a lot of materials. Yeah. I mean, like you said, I was a PhD student, so I didn't have that much free money to spend. Mm -hmm. And another example of that is actually right over here. This one's really nice. Yeah, this really is simple. Very simple idea. Again, two tree stakes, a two by two, and a net across. And what I'm using it for right now is to grow all these cucumbers. And we've actually got quite a nice amount of cucumbers off this. And this bed was one of the first ones that I double dug, mm -hmm. which I don't know, I'm sure you know about this. Method. I know it, but let me tell you this. You shouldn't know it because it is not worth the effort. And I'm surprised that you double dug, but why don't you explain what it is? Well, it's the first book I read. And also it's how I lost 50 pounds. But yeah. <laughs> basically you're digging and you're manually moving the soil from one side of the bed to the other. It's kind of like a weird process, but you're basically digging and moving the entire block of soil. Yeah. So very manual intensive. It's sort of just like manual tilling. Exactly. Really. Yeah, it is basically a manual till with a shovel. But now I've kind of transitioned to kind of a low tillage, nothing dogmatic and I try to be organic. So I used to use like all the synthetic crazy stuff at the beginning. I think most gardeners start off like that because you don't really know anything else. That's basically how this started. So this garden looks beautiful, Jacques, but there's a garden not 20 feet this way that's bigger <laughs> and better. But before I show you that, I wanna show you this tiny little contraption that is the reason Jacques and I even met in the first place. I slid into your DMs for it, let's just say that. Yeah, he was, he was a little hungry, he was a little thirsty. <laughs> let's go take a look. So we're over here in one of my seed starting areas where I have something you probably haven't seen in a while. I haven't seen these in two years, guys. These are <laughs> the original first batch Epic Six Cell trays. These are our seed starting trays. That it's the reason why you sent me that one message. <laughs> yeah, it's actually the first time we met in person. You realized I wasn't a weird old French man. And like, maybe we could do something together. Right, so I, I had just moved into the Epic Homestead and I put a call out for a garden assistant because 
I just needed help. I did not have enough time and energy to devote to the whole space myself. And that's where Jacques threw the straw hat in the ring. <laughs> yeah, basically the PhD was starting to grind on me a little bit and I wanted the lifestyle of being outside, which is originally why I started geology. Turns out that wasn't the case. You're just inside a lab all day. Yeah. So that was definitely an easy out for me. Yeah, and so as we worked together, we put in the citrus orchard that you guys know. We put in all sorts of different projects around the homestead and you sort of kept kind of grumbling about the program. Yeah, I, I was ready to leave and I was like, you know, if there's some other opportunity, like <laughs> maybe I should take it. And I was kind of maybe planting the seed. You were planting the seed also in reverse. We were, we were playing games. <laughs> we were playing games. Eventually, I decided to offer Jacques a position at Epic. And almost as soon as that happened, I know it took you a little bit to like kind of mull it over. Yeah, it's transition. a big decision. I mean, you're leaving a PhD program that you've invested Good decision. a lot of time in. That's a scary decision. Nevertheless, he made it. And not too long thereafter, we found ourselves up at Kehlani's house installing a custom <laughs> yeah. garden. I had bought a warehouse to start shipping these products as well as our birdies bed. So Jacques and I went up on a weekend to get a forklift certification to drive and ship orders to you guys. So it really became a wild ride after that. Yeah. And before we get into the wilder parts of it, this corn is calling my name. It's double the size of my <laughs> corn, which I'm embarrassed about. So let's take a look yeah. at the big garden. Let's do it. So let's talk about the corn. Knee high by the 4th of July. It's not the 4th of July and it's almost face high. This is massive <laughs> corn. <laughs> so this is actually a Martian Jules variety. This is a fun one that you could eat either as sweet corn or you could let it dry and make like masa, things like that. And that's why I planted it so densely because realistically, I can't eat this much corn. No. <laughs> no I remember amazing. you growing it last year and you couldn't yeah. eat that much corn and exactly. that's where this seed actually came from. Yeah, I saved the cob from last year. I shucked it, planted those kernels and it looks like that worked out pretty well. Yeah, and you're doing the three <laughs> sisters method. It just seems like one of the sisters is a little yeah. bigger than the rest. The, the corn sister turned out to be a little bossy and uh, I think it's out competing the beans. The squash is back there, you can't even see it. Yeah. But what you'll also see is that right here is actually one of my pollinator patches. Mm -hmm. When I started building the garden, I really wanted to build an ecosystem along with the food. Mm -hmm. So this is full of bugs, bees, everything that you would ever expect to see in a garden. And I like to keep it wild. Yeah. I like that balance in the garden. That's the difference food. between you and me. And I think we both influence each other. Yes. You've become perhaps slightly more orderly. I've become a little bit more natural and wild and, and having patches a yeah. little bit more like this because this just sort of grows itself. <laughs> I mean, it comes back totally. every single year. These yeah. straw flowers look incredible. And honestly, they, they, sound, they sound pretty cool as well <laughs> but you're growing tomatoes yet again so talk oh, yeah. to me about this method this is a, a method i'm pretty familiar with a lot of tomatoes going and this is my favorite way to grow them especially when you have a lot of them yeah this is a florida weave so there's t-post and string and all the strings doing is really just keeping the branches in place so they're not flopping all over the place mm -hmm. and actually this right here is a row of purely cherry tomato types all cherries all cherries yeah. so this is like one of the beds i've been doing rotations more recently it's something yeah. that i think we didn't practice before i've i've never really historically yeah. practiced crop but rotation no i just kind of had problems and now i move the tomatoes and they look absolutely incredible yeah talk to me about the pruning so you, it looks right. like you're taking off about a foot or so and then you're just letting it be yeah so my goal with tomatoes is always to have airflow because disease is like the biggest issue with tomatoes for most people especially fungal stuff yeah so i want a lot of airflow down here and I basically just remove anything that I can't easily support. Yeah. And that's pretty much the whole system. Yeah. So cherry tomatoes here, beef steaks here, peppers on both sides. Here's what I like <laughs> about this. And this is something I haven't quite gotten to the density of. Oh yeah. You have a really dense tomato bed here, but you're doing the classic marigolds. Let's oh, take yeah. a look at these guys. These are beautiful. Huge a, marigolds. A very classic interplanting recommendation. But then what Jacques did this year that I find really exciting and I'm kind of going to steal because I'm a little behind you on my peppers <laughs> yeah. is he just did a really simple tunnel and put some felt or some some row cover over this and it sped the growth up because we didn't really have that hot of a this, May. The first sunny week, literally <laughs> for the past couple months. Gardener's mind, right? You, exactly. you flex and you said, I need more heat on these peppers. And so I'll enclose them a little bit. And actually they're probably about 30% further along than mine. Granted, I, I started mine a little bit later, so I have a little cover, <laughs> but you've done quite a bit. And this back garden is lush and incredible. The goal is to just always have something to eat. Yeah. We love to grow food so that we could eat it. We love to cook. And that's really my goal when it comes to gardening is ecosystem and delicious food you can't find anywhere else. Yeah, and speaking of, you've built a coop. 
the oh, chicken yeah. coop, the piece de resistance of the garden, <laughs> full DIY. I know it took you a little bit of time, it definitely but did. let's take a look at that. Let's do it. So in terms of growing for flavor, it seemed like a natural extension to get backyard chickens, to yeah. get those fresh eggs, which are unparalleled, of course, in taste. Yeah. And that was kind of like the beginning journey of where I was starting to do so much different stuff. I was like, I got to start documenting it. Mm -hmm. I got to start recording it. Started the Instagram up, started everything up. Mm -hmm. Just began a journey. Yeah, well, Jacques, I mean, you were still a garden assistant and we were showing Jacques on Instagram. I think we were calling you the garden hermit at <laughs> yeah. the time. And yeah, we created a YouTube channel, Instagram, TikTok, which is weird because everything seems to just be another version of how to use that PhD, right? Absolutely, because I actually enjoy teaching in my PhD, yeah. but if I ever did that, I would only teach like the most like 20 people in a year. Now I get to teach hundreds of thousands, millions of people how to garden, which is way more gratifying anyway, because yeah. people get to learn how to grow food. Yeah, And that's way more valuable. Your career path would have been teaching the next Jacques how to be the next Jacques. <laughs> this sort of exactly. endless cycle of that's academia. <laughs> but speaking of, you've got this coop. We were sort of doing our coop journeys at the same time. Yeah. Obviously very different approaches. Yes. This is probably one of the coolest coops I've ever seen. So let's start with the outside here. So basically everything you see here was repurposed either for free off Craigslist or literally off the street. So you can see there's random kitchen cupboard doors here. Yeah. And this bar is like, yeah, it's, it's a little like intense. you're in the purge or yeah. something like this is very intense. This is uh, to stop the raccoons because uh, apparently they're quite crafty and uh, our chickens are our pets. So we wanted to make sure that they were safe no matter what. And this entire thing actually just sits on a pallet. Can so I we really tried to do here? it cheaply. Yeah. There's a, there we go. There we go. So this is your deep litter method. Exactly. That you're doing, you're using hemp bedding. Yep. And so when's the last time you cleaned this out? Have you ever? I've cleaned it out once. Yeah. And I've had this now for two years. Yeah. So it lasts a long time. It's similar for me it's in my, in my coop. Yeah. So this outside all DIY yeah. and you wired up some lighting and stuff too. Yeah. There was like motion lights. That was kind of an extra layer. We were scared of like, uh, raccoons and stuff. Not really that big of a deal. Honestly, it's probably wouldn't even scare them off anyway. Yeah. Well, but, the roof, where'd you get the roof? So the roof was actually the one thing I had to purchase, which was a piece of uh, corrugated sheet metal that I just basically attached to the surface and yeah. painted white to keep it a little bit cool. Yeah. And this whole thing was a couple hundred bucks. That's crazy. It, it was really just the expense of buying hardware cloth and that roof. And then the it. time. Yeah, right? a lot of time. It took, how much, how much time. time do you think it took? Let's get under it here. It took like maybe three full weekends. Wow. Uh, because none of this wood was straight. None of it was meant to fit together. Yeah. It was just a napkin sketch basically. And from there, we just had to figure out how to put it together. Yeah, and I mean, we did. Let's, it works. Let's, let's, let's peek inside yeah, because let's this get in is, there. again, it's one of the most unique coops I've seen. It's like so you, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Hop on in. <laughs> oh, oh shirt's hello, shirt. trying to get some action on you. So everything's bolt for my height, but even in here, it's a, a little bit short. A little, little, little tight. And so you could see like, I mean, it's not the prettiest coop, but it's yeah. extremely functional. The chickens love it. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was pretty fun to put together. I would do it again. Uh, but maybe I would uh, look for a little bit better wood. Spend just a little, little <laughs> extra. You've got the Coopworks feeder, you've got the oyster, yep. you've got the gravel, everything the they need. So everything they need. But the thing that's the most interesting, guys, about Jacques' chicken coop is really not in the coop itself. It's right over here. <laughs> and this is a video you and I did together. Probably one of our first big collaborations. Yeah, on the main channel. And this is Jacques' chicken orchard. So I've never... I don't think anyone's ever heard of a chicken orchard before, so talk to us about it. <laughs> so this is kind of like an idea. It's again, like I think since I didn't have that gardening perspective, yeah. I could come up with things that are weird. Yeah. And so I was like, I saw these trees surrounds. So I was like, okay, if I use these, the chickens won't be able to dig up the roots as easily. Mm -hmm. So now they're safe. And then you also get the benefit of them pooping everywhere. And it's basically fertilizing these trees for free. Yeah. They're providing shade, keeping the chickens happy. And I mean, just look how many figs are on this. Yeah. Like, it's absolutely incredible. It's only been about a year and a half since we did this. Yeah. So it's yeah. it's clearly the theory has been proven in practice. It is Very growing happy. out really well. And I think pretty soon you're gonna remove this, right? <laughs> yeah, once these grow up enough, they'll provide enough cover from like hawks. And yeah. that's really the only reason this is here. So from a custom coop to a beautiful front yard to this incredible corn patch, Jacques, you have come a very long way in two years. <laughs> it's true. And actually, you could watch my whole journey on my YouTube channel where I have a lot of videos on how I built this and also a lot of future videos on the way of how I'm going to continue to expand this. And if you want to be the next Jacques, the mission of Epic Gardening is literally to teach the world to grow. Two dudes in Southern California <laughs> can't do it on their own. We need people like you. So if you have a different perspective, a different background, a different geography, check the link in the description to figure out how you can work with us. And I think we need to get back to the actual garden today, Jacques. A lot to do. Good luck in the garden and keep on growing.